So uh, my topic for today, and this is really the first presentation I'm giving at Noventa, is multiplying like fruit flies. Uh, I'm going to talk about algorithmic speedups via LSH and friends. So I'm going to cover a lot of topics, right? And what I want us to be is uh, either the walrus or the carpenter, but not the oyster in this situation, right? We don't want to get, uh, uh, basically, we don't want to be at the receiving end of uh, uh, heavy resource consumption. So uh, what's on the agenda for today? Uh, I'm going to talk about algorithmic speedups. What are they? Why do we do them? Uh, how do we use them? Who else is using them? Then I'm going to pick one specific technique called locality sensitive hashing. Uh, I'm going to talk about how it works, uh, what are the different variations, uh, which uh, is a good segue into bio inspired hashing, uh, which was basically uh, uh, the original topic that uh, Jeff asked me to look at uh, and you know kickstart discussions around. So with that, I'm going to start with algorithmic speedups. So what exactly are algorithmic speedups? Uh, again, this is, uh, it's not uh, uh, a term that comes from the literature. It's uh, essentially a bucket that I'm using uh, to capture a lot of techniques from uh, CS, linear algebra, signal processing, data mining, uh, you know, streaming data, so on. And basically all of these techniques, uh, they have uh, heavy conceptual overlaps and together they can be used to speed up neural network training or inference. Uh, so from uh, the CS side of things, uh, you, from you know, the probabilistic data structures, randomized algorithm space, uh, you have things like Bloom filters, Cuckoo filters, quotient filters uh, for approximate membership uh, querying. Uh, you have Q-digest, Kipless, Treeps, uh, hyperlog logs, uh, you know, count distincts, things like that. Uh, there, there's a specific uh, sub area uh, of uh, probabilistic data structures that's really useful for streaming data. So these would be things like uh, count sketches, uh, frequent items, count min sketches, uh, uh, frequent directions, uh, reservoir sampling, and so on. Uh, there's another space uh, that sort of overlaps uh, uh, with uh, linear algebra, and that's uh, locality sensitive hashing. Uh, and again, I'm going to walk through what uh, locality sensitive hashing is uh, is and how it's different from uh, the you know standard issue hashing uh, techniques that we would normally be familiar with. Quantization again, uh, I'm sort of uh, preaching to the choir here, but uh, most of you are familiar with uh, different sorts of quantization techniques. I just uh, put those in for. Uh, the sake of completeness. Uh, finally, uh, one area that uh, I've uh, done a bunch of experiments on is uh, the randomized uh, linear algebra space. So uh, here my focus has been on basically uh, doing matrix approximations that together with ideas from streaming data can be used to uh, do fast matrix sketching. And I'll talk about what that means. And that in turn can be used to speed things up uh, for matrix multiplies. So why are we interested in algorithmic speedups? Uh, first of all, uh, on, uh, on the positives, right? We want to be resource efficient. We do not want to be on the, we want to save the polar bears. We, uh, definitely, uh, you want to pay for Bezos's next trip to the moon or Mars or whatever. Uh, and uh, we want to be able to make biologically plausible systems, right? Uh, the way I think about it, uh, in order to do a computation, uh, you know, our brains don't consume that much in the way of power or resources. And uh, that is uh, a reassuring signal that. Uh, this problem of uh, you know of being of doing computes that are easy on resources, uh, this problem has been solved. We have to figure out a way to do it in silicon instead of uh, uh, on a carbon substrate. 
So what are some heuristics on how to actually uh, use algorithmic speedups? Uh, the way I'm thinking about it, uh, the number, these seem like truisms, right? but they're actually very helpful. So number one is don't repeat yourself. Right? You want to be able to cache any computations that you do. You want to be able to look up very quickly. And uh, the best way to basically solve a problem is to know the answer already, and then you state the answer. Uh, the second heuristic that uh, uh, I would like us to keep in mind is close enough is good enough. And the idea here is that uh, if you're using randomized algorithms, uh, if you're using uh, probabilistic data structures, uh, and uh, we are okay with uh, uh, you know, lopping off uh, least significant bits, uh, and we are okay with approximation-driven noise, that will uh, hopefully make the networks uh, that we construct more resilient to noise. Um, and one way of thinking about that is basically, if you don't know the answer already, uh, you want to search for similar, similar problems that you've solved before, you want to get the solution, uh, you want to make some changes, and then you take a guess. And this is useful even in terms of things like uh, matrix multiplication, as uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the quickest ways of doing a matrix multiplication is to have done it already and then come up with the answer. Right. Uh, uh, the second best way is to find approximations and then uh, come up with an answer. So who is doing algorithmic speedups uh, uh, these days? I found a bunch of papers uh, uh, in this particular area. Uh, the first one uh, that I'll briefly talk about, random sketch learning for deep neural networks and edge computing. This was published in March this year. Um, in nature computational science. And the idea was basically using matrix sketching and scalar quantization to uh, increase acceleration during training by uh, 180x and reducing energy consumption by 10x. Uh, the second paper that uh, uh, is referred here is multiplying matrices without multiplying. Uh, this very recently got a whole bunch of uh, attention on uh, Hacker News. And uh, the idea was uh, they are able to do uh, 100x speedups for exact matrix multiplies and 10x speedups for approximate multiplies. And the way they do it is by hashing, by you know, not repeating computations. So they do a little bit of locality sensitive hashing, a lot of product quantization to power the hashing. Um, they do a lot of uh, uh, what's uh, known as mechanical sympathy in, in the sense that uh, they do hardware specific optimizations that make sure that uh, the compute uh, leverages uh, uh, you know, instructions, uh, the AVX512 set and things like that uh, to, uh, to get that last uh, marginal uh, speed bump. Yeah, hey, Anshuman, I have a question about that. Uh, yeah. the, it seems a little weird that their speed up for exact matrix multiplies would be higher than for approximate you'd expect approximate stuff to go much faster. Yes, I agree. And uh, uh, this is basically- Why don't you just do 100x then? To the exact multiplies, why bother with the approximate? It's, it's a very fair uh, question. And uh, so just to clarify, the claims are what uh, they have stated. Uh, it's not my interpretation. Uh, from my perspective, uh, a lot of the speed up is basically because uh, they're essentially looking up the answer. Right? They've, Done the computer before and they're looking at the answer. And then my point is uh, if the exact ones are 10 times faster than the approximate multiplies, why bother with approximate multiplies? I just assumed it was a different baseline. Okay, so 10x faster than people have done approximate multiplies before, no. not 10x faster than a, you know, a standard matrix. Oh, okay. so that's okay. what I thought, right? So the 10x speed up for approximate multiplies is still faster than the 100x speed up for exact matrix yeah. multiplies. So that, it'd be useful to get those yeah. on the same scale, maybe. Anyway, OK, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the third paper is uh, Mongoose, which is uh, basically, uh, it comes from the folks at uh, Rice uh, CS, who are sort of uh, doing a lot of work on algorithmic speedups for deep learning. Uh, and they basically use uh, uh, 
a specific data dependent uh, LSH technique uh, to speed up uh, uh, deep neural network training. And uh, Linfarmer, Reformer, these are uh, specific uh, types of uh, transformers, again, that use low rank matrix approximation and LSH uh, respectively to uh, uh, speed up uh, the attention mechanism. Uh, slide was uh, uh, really uh, a breakthrough paper from the Rice uh, computer science folks, uh, where they basically demonstrated uh, really fast training on CPU uh, for admittedly a fairly simple neural network. And uh, they're still working on, uh, I believe, uh, making it fast for all kinds of neural networks. Yeah, these are the guys that, they're the same as the Mongoose guys, right? And they just recently founded Bird AI, which is that company where they got that awesome Forbes quote, where it's just like, you know, NVIDIA should be afraid, very afraid type thing, right? Um, seems a little bit uh, hyperbole, but uh, well. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think uh, to their credit, they, they've been doing a lot of research. I've looked at the papers over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, in this particular space, uh, and they keep building new novel data structures. So let's see, let's see uh, what they do. So with that, it's question time. If you guys have any questions uh, for this brief uh, section, if not, how many of these people have published code? Like, so for those nature dudes, yeah. is there yeah. a GitHub? There is a GitHub for. Uh, each of these, as far as I remember. Um, that's cool. I could add the links, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. And yeah. when you say 44 cores, do you, is the AVX 512 cores in the third, in the last one there? I the don't know. No, I don't not, think so. The original slide paper was not uh, AVX, right? It wasn't AVX. Yeah, they did a recent paper this year at uh, ML CIS, I think, or CIS, whatever the, the conference is, where they got some additional kicker on top from doing AVX 512. Yeah. But all of these are like C++ implementations, oh, yeah. is that right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, you can't get that speed up in Python. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just wondering, because uh, is it sort of smarter use of PyTorch functions or numpy functions, but it's really raw? So a lot of the slide stuff as well, sorry, Antoine, is, is like, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like completely divorced from PyTorch, right? right. If you have a little YAML file that you specify your, uh, oh, I think it's a CSV, you specify your neural network, yeah. and then that's it. It's completely self-contained. Yeah. It only does linear layers and things like that, right? So I think the, that... Yeah, yeah, that's always been kind of the awkward thing is people who are actually doing neural net research can't actually use a lot of these things. So yeah. that is the goal that we have with this, right, is that all the work that Anshan is doing, right, I think it's important to put it in the context is, can we accelerate dendrites for us today? Yeah. You know, can Anshan make dendrites run five times, 50 times, 100 times faster to unlock research for you guys, right? Yeah. So none of these crappy little C++ projects, yeah. which are sort of research curiosities, how right. do we take what we've done Put it into PyTorch and make you guys' life That's easier. Inference and training? Or just inference and training. Tra inference and training. This would work for training too. This is the part of the beauty of uh, Antron stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, what is the session part? Uh, yeah. Just to be clear, I'm doing most of my stuff on NumPy, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. but we, you know, we are looking at how to drag and drop into PyTorch, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, just to emphasize Lawrence's point, I think. Uh, uh, from what I've seen, a lot of the uh, is, uh, guys is uh, frameworks, which is not very portable. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, we have uh, substantial space to make improvements. So I'm going to skip question time uh, in the interest of time, and I'll uh, talk about localities instead of hashing. Uh, so first of all, hashing as we know it. Right. Again, uh, this is sort of a, a refresher for you guys because uh, most of you live and breathe a lot. Hash functions, uh, they are essentially used to map data from uh, uh, you know, a essentially larger domain to a smaller range. Right? And because uh, of this reason, uh, essentially uh, the, the one way, you can't reverse the function to get uh, 
uh, the corresponding key for a given value. Uh, also gives rise uh, uh, to the idea of uh, collision uh, management, because there is a possibility that many keys may map to a single value. Uh, and uh, there are traditional techniques uh, on the hashing side of things uh, to manage collisions. Uh, hash tables are basically uh, they use uh, their, their data structure that use uh, uh, hash functions to store key value pairs, right? And uh, one of the most popular examples of uh, a hash table is Python's uh, dict structure. Uh, they have a bunch of uh, uh, custom uh, improvements over vanilla uh, hashing that they use. For instance, uh, they assume that uh, all keys are strings initially until they come across something different, right? And uh, they do sort of uh, micro optimizations uh, in order to make uh, the implementation as fast as possible. Uh, but really, it's it's a hash table. So uh, that's hashing as we know it. Um, now we want to move on to locality sensitive hashing. And I want to motivate uh, the discussion of why we need this and what it is. Right uh, now, in, in a very abstract sense, uh, if we want to do a nearest neighbor search, uh, we really need to do an exact search. Uh, we, uh, the example that I, uh, the metaphor that I use is generally, uh, you know, you're stuck in an airport, there are uh, 5,000 people, and you want to be, uh, you know, it's raining, you want to be able to get home, uh, but you don't know, uh, you want to basically uh, carpool. Uh, so for that, you want to find out who else is living in the same state as you are. You can go around and you can ask everybody. That's 5,000 uh, questions that you're going to ask. Uh, order of 5,000, obviously, the first person who says Connecticut or California uh, uh, wins. Right? But really, uh, if you want to uh, dig down further and find the exact uh, match, right? uh, I want to find somebody in Stanford, uh, Connecticut, or Redwood City then uh, uh, you know it's uh, it's going to take some time so uh, one way of bypassing this is basically asking everybody uh, is setting up 50 uh, uh, spaces uh, one for each state and asking everyone to go to uh, uh, their state right so then you basically make a beeline for the Connecticut or the California uh, space and then you ask everyone there, and that speeds up things. Uh, so coming back to nearest neighbor search, we know an exhaustive, uh, exhaustive linear search will take uh, order n time. Uh, for low dimensional spaces, there are data structures such as uh, KD trees that basically uh, split the search space, and they are able to provide uh, uh, an order log n time complexity. The issue with uh, things like KD trees is they don't scale well to high dimensional spaces. So as uh, uh, your dimensionality of your uh, data points goes above, uh, say, 10 or 15, then uh, KD trees uh, degrade to order n. So they basically start, uh, uh, it's, it's almost equivalent to uh, doing a linear search at that point in time. So what we want to do is we want to be able to uh, make things faster than a linear search. We really don't want to look at everything. So if we allow for an approximate nearest neighbor search, then we can do better than order n, even for really high dimensional spaces. So this is uh, the core of the locality sensitive hashing uh, technique. And it makes use of something called the Johnson Linden Strauss Lemma, uh, something uh, that uh, Lawrence and I um, grappled with uh, at an earlier company uh, a lot. Uh, uh, basically, the idea with the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma is that uh, uh, a set of points in a high dimensional space, uh, they can be embedded into a low dimensional space in such a way that Euclidean distances are preserved within a certain multiplicative uh, error factor. So, the interesting thing about this is it does not depend on the dimensionality of the original space, only depends upon the density of the points in that space. 
So imagine if you will, uh, you know, a hundred thousand uh, dimensions and you want to squeeze them down to say 200 dimensions, you should be able to do that. Uh, and uh, the JL lemma basically says uh, that it's possible. Uh, it's not a construction proof, but uh, it's an existence proof essentially. So with that in mind, uh, what LSH does is basically uh, it maps any two given points in the original space, any point in the original space, it maps them to a low dimensional space such that with high probability, if the two points, their hashes match, the probability of them matching is equivalent to the similarity of those two data points. So in contrast to our vanilla hashing techniques, LSH families of hash functions, they encourage collisions for similar data points. So um, I'm going to make that clearer in the next slide. Uh, so how does LSH actually uh, do that? So th there are a whole bunch of ways in which uh, you can, one can implement locality sensitive hashing. Uh, one of the standard ways is uh, by using random projections. Uh, there are other techniques such as min hash and sim hash uh, that are good for specific kinds of metrics. Uh, I'm using random projections in this particular uh, example to, uh, I think it's a very intuitive way to think about things. So you start by building an index of uh, all the data points. Uh, in your data set. And how do you do that? You start by sampling k random vectors from uh, a normal uh, distribution of the same dimensions. And uh, you basically... Uh, could you explain that, what you mean by from the same dimensions? I think it seems like that's the key item here. I mean, yeah. you said uh, a, a random sampling, quite great. Yeah. I can imagine a random sampling, but random sampling of the same dimensions, I don't know what that means. Yeah, so if you think about it this way, uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, a thousand dimensional vector, right, you want to create uh, a random vector that is of thousand dimensions, each entry in that vector is sampled from a n01. Does that make sense? No, not really, sorry. Um, um, Jeff, if you think about like a, a single column in the spatial pooler, one of the uh, the runs, it's sample, it's, it's got a set of random permanences from the space below, right? And, and if you have, if your potential space is the full space, then the number of random permanences you have is the same number as the number of input bits you have. That's all he's saying. It's random just, permanences. Um, we don't have random permanences, right? I mean. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, Yep. Okay. Each I mean, I, column, each, each column is um, the column. number of permanences it has is equal to the number of input bits that you have below. Below. Uh, right. The again, number of input bits that are coming in. That's all this saying is each of these vectors is going to uh, multiply these numbers with yeah. the input. So you need to have the same number of numbers there as you have input bits. Okay, so that, okay, so. You might have a smaller number of these vectors, but each vector is, has to multiply against the input. So you need the full set of uh, weights against the input. Um, okay, I have, a, I have a vague sense of this. Um, yeah, okay, let's, let's keep going then. Okay. So think of, uh, I don't, so I tend to think of this as, uh, uh, sampling each entry, like I said before, from uh, uh, an n01. And uh, essentially, the vectors are of the same length as uh, the data point, if that makes sense to you. So if there are 1,000 entries uh, in uh, for each uh, data point, each data point has 1,000 dimensions, then we are uh, creating a random vector. We're creating k random vectors, each having uh, 1,000 uh, dimensions. So uh, the idea here is basically uh, when we use these random vectors and uh, 
we use these to describe uh, hyperplanes through that space. So each of these random vectors basically bisects the hyperplane in the sense that some data points will be on one side and some data points will be on the other side of the vector. Can I just ask a basic question? I mean, yeah. the, whole, when you, the way you describe this uh, LSH thing is that um, you want to do, you, you're trying to do local hashing, right? You're trying to figure out how to basically make collisions based on locality yeah. of, of input yeah. points. Yeah. And so, but the random projection seems sort of counterintuitive. Why would I be doing anything random? The whole point was to try to figure out where things, so that's you, one you of don't the, want to do a random hash. Right? No, 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 it's, it's fair. Uh, that's the question I had as well. And uh, it's interesting, but the math sort of works out in that uh, the probability of you, uh, the probability of two data points that are not close to each other in uh, like as per some distance metric, hashing to the same bucket uh, goes down as you increase uh, K. So as you throw in more and more random numbers at that space, uh, random vectors at that space, uh, you start to get really fine grained buckets. And, I think it's important uh, to remember, this is not a random hash. These are random vectors, but yeah. nearby points are gonna have similar outputs. I mean, you're taking these random vectors, I get that. So it's you, not a you, random hash the way it, Yeah, they're. I know. But the point was we want to do a hash that's not random, but we, we're starting these random vectors. I'm trying to get the intuition of this because in high dimensional space is always tricky. Yeah. Um, so you, you're taking this vector, sure, it's a hyperplane, you're dividing the space in half somehow, mm -hmm. and you're taking a lot of these, therefore you're saying, I'm gonna divide this up in a whole bunch of little buckets, which yeah. you, the intersection of these hyperplanes ends up little volumes of hyperspace, right? Right, right. Um, all right, I got that image in my head. Okay. And now, now you're making a claim after that, which I'm, I, I want to make sure I understand. Your, your claim yeah. somehow is that if I take two points in the original space, yeah. And I and I'm using the buckets defined by these random hyperplanes, mm -hmm. that there's a very good chance that the points in the original space that are near each other will be in the same bucket. Correct. Yeah. Now that's not intuitive to me yet. Well, like, look, that's what the Johnson-Linnan-Strauss lemma means. Exactly. Looks, I, the two people talked there once, I'm sorry. That's not intuitive to me or anyone, but that's what the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma says. Okay. It says that a random normal, well, it says more than this, but a random normal matrix has the restricted isometry property, which means when you multiply points by this random normal matrix, the distances are preserved with high probability. The distance between things between buckets or the things within a bucket? Between the original data points. The original data points. And, but now we're saying that the ones that are in the same bucket have the same distance or the ones? No, so, no, no, no. No. The ones uh, out between buckets. Uh, so basically, uh, the random vectors uh, were depending I think, on. I think we're overthinking this. I think we're overthinking. This is really simple. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you have a, if you multiply, if you take a input, and you do a bunch of random projections to it, you get some output. If you make a yeah. tiny change to the input, yeah. the projection, you're, you're gonna end up near the point. Near the same small thing, changes yeah. in the input are gonna have small changes in the output. And yeah. every once in a while, you'll cross a boundary, but most of the time you won't. Yeah. It's yeah. just like why a random spatial cooler preserves yeah. singularity as well. It's the okay. same thing. All right, I get that. That, that helps me a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very intuitive. I mean, yeah, yeah, the random, it is in that way, I, if I can say it's analogous to the random spatial polar. Okay, um, that's what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, actually, uh, and yeah. we were surprised how well the random spatial polar worked. Yeah. And then, uh, but after a while, I got an intuitive sense for that. Yeah. Uh, and if that's, if this is the same basic idea, then okay, I'm good. It's, it's interesting that you're talking about it this way because uh, uh, I remember talking to Subutai about this. And I came about it from the other way where I was like, okay, LSH makes a lot of sense to me, right? And then when he talked about spatial pooling and how it works, and I was like, oh, I can see uh, uh, you know, the conceptual links. So I have a slide on that a uh, bit later. But basically, you know, you chop up the space, you find buckets. Uh, so now you don't have to uh, query each data point in the data set. You just basically look at uh, the points in the, uh, in uh, your particular bucket. So that enables you to get sublinear uh, time nearest neighbor search. So, you know, it's, 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 in the way you just describe it now, it's exactly what the random spatial pooler does, 
except we don't think, I don't think of the random spatial puller as some sort of, um, it, it's, it's a way, I've always felt it was a way of reducing a very high dimensional space to a low dimensional space without losing much information. Mm -hmm. um, and you, and it, it was basically, uh, it was based on the idea that there was an overlap between the original points, the, you know, they, these are sparse vectors or the vectors, and so they fit a common set of number of ones are going to be in the same bucket. But to me, that was not, that was, that was to get the data into a normalized form that I could work with. Um, that I could then say, oh, now we can learn sequences of these things. Uh, and now we can learn, you know, context of these things, but not in terms of an efficiency of, I guess it's the same thing. I never thought of it as like, oh, this is a technique to improve our multiplications. It was more like, no, this, I just need to get into this lower dimensional regular form where I can operate on it. But maybe that's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there seems to be a lot of conceptual overlaps in this space, so. There's one big difference, though, uh, in the yeah. spatial pooler, we we introduce sparsity by only keeping the top few and then zero out the rest. So we're only keeping the highest magnitude components of these projections. Mm -hmm. Here, it's keeping all of them, and so it's it's a dense output. But it's they're trying to make it in k to be small. In our case, we keep the dimensionality high, but we choose a small number of winners. So this, there's a slight difference there. That's mm. uh, to Subutai's point. Uh, this is something that we uh, that I'll cover in the bio-inspired hashing section. Uh, you know, the fly hash and all of that. Uh, but that's a really good point. I think uh, that's a big difference between vanilla random projection and uh, what's happening on the uh, on the bio-inspired side. Uh, just an FYI, I didn't follow Subutai's point, but I don't think we need to go into it now. I just point out that it wasn't obvious to me what you're saying. So, but I, I, I have a general idea what you're trying to do here. So, from my okay. point of view, we can go on. Okay. So uh, these are one, uh, one quick question. Um, yeah. So you know, this it's not clear to me. This choosing from this normal distribution is the right thing to do. You yeah. um, know, and it seems like there's probably much better distributions you could you could sample from. Yeah. So totally agreed, and that's a nice segue into uh, uh, the next slide, which is basically using sparse projections. So uh, there's been a lot of work in this particular area of using uh, random projections. So uh, a couple of things that folks have done, uh, there's Dimitris Akioptas, who uh, in a paper showed that you can get uh, a fairly decent speed up by instead of sampling from uh, you know uh, a unit ball of uh, random vectors you would sample uh, you know you just throw plus ones and minus ones right or you can do plus ones zeros and minus ones so if you put, throw in the zero then it's uh, uh, fairly sparse right um, and when you create this you do get a speed up in your index building as well as querying uh, then uh, trevor hasty and uh, a couple of others uh, came up with another pa uh, paper where they said, if you construct your random vectors this particular way, uh, uh, bottom left, uh, then you can get a root D speed up in both uh, the index building and the query. So uh, essentially, instead of doing uh, uh, dense random vectors, you are building sparse vectors. So. Uh, does that help? Should I? Uh, any questions? Are they dense or just simply quantized? Uh, say that again. What was the question? You, you were saying that they're they're sparse. Are they are, are they sparse or are they simply quantized? You still have you have the fact that you have some zeros in there on the on the second formulation. Yeah. yeah. You had the first formulation where it's plus or minus one. Um, I'm just I'm just trying to it's, think whether it, you you simply quantized it rather than actually. Well, it, it says zero with probability two thirds. Doesn't that mean yeah. that it's yeah? So it's, 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 for, for the uh, second formulation, I was looking at the first one where he has plus or minus one. Yeah, well, those are not those are not sparse, right? But those are basically uh, just throwing plus ones. Mm -hmm. and plus ones. I, I guess the bottom one would be sparse if D is pretty oh, high. Uh, uh, no, 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 they're not sparse. Yeah. Yeah. If D is low, then uh, yeah. Isn't the second one sparse? If I have two thirds zeros, the second one is sparse, and the third one is also sparse if you put uh, root D to be uh, low. Yeah. 
Oh, okay, I see, I see. Yeah, I was saying the first one, you know, you can use having distance as a as a metric. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, some variations uh, on uh, locality sensitive hashing. Uh, the first immediate variation that I'm sure a bunch of you have already thought about is uh, replicated, right? So instead of why do uh, one sampling of random vectors when you can do multiple sampling, uh, multiple sampling sets and create multiple hash tables? So replicated basically does that, right? Uh, so instead of uh, doing one uh, draw of k vectors, you do multiple draws of k vectors. And what is the advantage of that? What's the point of that? Uh, the basic idea there is basically reduce, uh, uh, essentially reduce the probability of uh, 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 false. Uh, okay, but you're but you're just multiplying your your incrementing your comp your computation then, right? Yeah, that's true. Okay, all right. So you're saying, yeah, maybe it didn't work one way. Let's try a bunch of other ways, but then I have multiple. That's that trade-off might be worth it for some situations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, entropy. Uh, LSH is basically the idea is uh, you jitter the query, right? So you move it around and you sample all the buckets that the jittered query points fall into, if that makes sense. So instead of like, you assume that if something is close to bucket boundaries, jittering might help uh, uh, move over to another bucket, right? So you can query uh, so that you can look at, uh, you can still get good uh, uh, near neighbor candidates. Excuse me, going back to the replicated, yeah, is yeah. this a stupid analogy? I, 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 I may admit, but I'm thinking like, hey, in the spatial pooler, you know, each mini column is it's, it's, it could be, it, it could be an error, but the sum of them would unlikely be an error. Um, and so, you know, the general, all of our systems work that way, right? You, you right. can have an error in a neuron, error in a mini column, right. uh, because there's a set of them. Um, yeah. Is that the same idea there? Could I say the spatial pooler is a replicated type of system? Because no, each I don't no? think so. I don't okay. Think so. <laughs> I, I do think, okay, I'll defer to Subutai on this, uh, but I feel like the idea, the essence is very similar that you know you have a bunch of uh, uh, different variations of uh, the same technique, right? And uh, different uh, implementations, yeah. This might be a stretch, but if you had, if you wanted to force the comparison, you could say two different cortical columns might have their own hash tables. One of the spatial poolers is one of them. The, the in the next cortical column, and that spatial pooler is another hash table. It, I'm kind of forcing the the comparison here, but loosely that would be how it how you. Yeah, that's it. how I read it too. Like replicated would be multiple spatial poolers, not a single. Okay, all right, I guess. But, uh, so I see that. And, and so my, my intuition is still correct. I mean, in, in all of our systems, you know, it, if a one column is not doing very well, but 99 others are fine, it's, it's not gonna be a problem um, if one has an error. I mean, it's a general property of these distributed systems, right? That we can tolerate errors in any of the elements. So in this case, you could say I could tolerate an error in one of the columns, because that would be a correct assessment. Yeah. Well, Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, that's yes. The, the virtue of having multiple hash tables is like having multiple col cortical right. columns. Yes, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, okay, just very quickly uh, finishing this off. Uh, multi probe is uh, the idea again is uh, when you find a bucket because you know sort of, uh, of you know the coordinates of the bucket, you can look at nearby buckets as well and you sample along those. Uh, data dependent is uh, you create. Uh, the hashes uh, using information about uh, the data distribution, right? So That'd you want like to make sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I was gonna say that's a large spatial pool, right? You want to make sure that you oversample on really dense uh, uh, neighborhoods, you know? Yeah, and, and, and we achieve that with uh, the, the, the large spatial pool that does that as well. It basically the um, the boosting function forces that uh -huh. that you, if you have a dense area, it'll divide up that area. Yeah. Um, so that all the basically all the, the buckets become sort of equally used. Right. Right. Count based. This is something new that I uh, discovered when uh, going through the literature, and this is something the Rice uh, CS folks have been using to speed up things uh, on Slide and Mongoose. Uh, basically, they don't uh, uh, 
they don't compute the distance. They use frequency counts and they use uh, frequency uh, using frequency counts. They basically uh, identify the indices of uh, neighbor candidates and then they report that. And then they use that downstream for other purposes. Is but, this a frequency over a long period of time or are you saying local frequency? Because, you know, yeah, things that are temporally close to each other and would, would be correlated, but things that, you know, occur over larger uh, distances in time, I don't see why that would work. Uh, this is sort of uh, local frequency, uh, local in the sense of both, uh, uh, you know, the particular uh, execution step that is happening in uh, uh, their algorithms, right? They'll have a matrix and uh, they're looking up hash tables. Uh, so it's a part of that. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you. Uh, no, but let's keep going. Okay. Okay. So this uh, comes from my conversation. <laughs> it's pretty fun. <laughs> uh, so you can think of LSH as an encoder that maps inputs via random connections. Uh, this mapping may be performed via sparse binary random projections. And uh, the addition of a winner takes all mechanism brings out uh, really strong links to spatial pooling and SDR encoding. I'll be the first to admit I am still learning about a lot of this. So uh, uh, pardon my ignorance, but I really like uh, the affinity uh, to uh, this particular space between LSH and uh, spatial pooling. I'm sure you guys will take a lot more from uh, this idea than I do. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Although it makes me wonder, like, well, oh, how, how much do I have to really understand this LHS stuff? Get because I really understand this fish ruler. So, you know, what am I gonna? What what additional insights am I gonna get? I'm, I'm not saying there won't be any. I'm just, you know. Yeah, just, I mean, they are different. They're, they're not identical. There are key yeah. differences. Um, and right now, I think you're proposing LSH as a way of speeding up some of our computation. So we should look at it just purely from that point. Yeah. But maybe there's more we can take away as well. Yes. And uh, again, I'm sort of uh, coming at it from the other side uh, as Jeff, and that goes into, uh, it's a nice segue into the next section, which is, uh, well, not this, this is just question time, in case you guys have any. <laughs> we're not we're not waiting for question time for our questions, so you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised you don't have a mongoose there instead of a monkey. Oh, oh I'm just, <laughs> just okay. I didn't get that joke. <laughs> so, so I have one question. The slide where you showed uh, different uh, criteria for finding uh, candidates for uh, uh, proximity matches. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think. Yeah. If you use the analogy to the spatial pooler, what some of those things would look like in contrast to how we're currently doing it with the spatial pooler. Uh, the analogy that that uh, Marcus made of uh, having two hash tables and being represent two cortical columns, uh, in particular the one where you have frequency as a proxy for distance. Yeah. What 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 kind of structure would that? How would that? If you if you made that assumption, how would that transform what we currently think of as a spatial pooler to use that as a metric instead? What would that look like? Uh, I'll be very honest, I'll defer that question to the audience because I know I'm still like at 0.1% of my understanding of spatial pooling. Okay, uh, I'll just pose it that what I, I found interesting about that slide, but it's in fact you're coming through from a different yeah. point of view, yeah. is take each one of those concepts for how you, uh, how you develop, you know, uh, the notion of what is something is close. Uh -huh. And what that would look like in the in the context of a spatial pool, or what transformations would they would that make? Some of which might be biologically plausible, some of them might not be. But I, I think it's an interesting exercise. I mean, that's that's what you leverage by coming from a different domain is that you take the richness of that mathematical domain and say, yeah. okay, we built this thing up with a set of assumptions. What happens if we break the assumptions, substitute one of these other ones in? Do we get something? more interesting or is it not relevant? Yeah. No, I totally agree. Uh, again, to Subutai's point, uh, 
my focus so far has been very specific on uh, speeding up matrix computes. Uh, but these, uh, this is sort of a grab bag of ideas, you know, that you can use to uh, uh, seed multiple alternative uh, designs, if you will. And you, you want to be able to see uh, which ones match with, uh, uh, match or are biologically plausible. Uh, and uh, it's sort of where uh, the next section leads, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about bio-inspired hashing. And uh, this is uh, really where Jeff asked me to look at a bunch of papers and uh, sort of summarize and kickstart discussions around. Uh, so uh, just be clear, I didn't suggest any particular papers on Shimon. <laughs> I was re I was responding to something you said, and I said, hey, yeah. that sounded interesting. Could you talk more about it? Yes. I, I have no idea what you're going to talk about here. OK, awesome. So I'm going to talk about fruit flies. Uh, <laughs> 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 all right hold on okay so this was basically the paper that started it all uh this was uh this was in science i believe uh, uh so dasgupta stevens and navlaka uh they made a bunch of claims they said the fruit fly uh olfactory circuit basically uh uh, solves similarity search, and it does so with a kind of locality sensitive hashing. And the way it does it is, again, it's different from vanilla LSH by using sparse uh, binary projections. Uh, it expands the dimensionality instead of uh, reducing the dimensionality. And it uses a winner takes all mechanism to sparsify uh, the representation. Why would it expand the dimensionality? I, oh, oh I, oh, I can see why. Uh, maybe it's because maybe from the olfactory organ itself, there's a certain a limited set of um, chemical markers it could detect, and it's detecting them in various levels, and you want to break that apart into a sparse representation. So you're going from a low dimensional space with a, which is uh, dense. Is that right? I think it also makes sense that uh, uh, the sparse representation helps uh, separate out concepts in this case uh, smells um, yeah i understand you i understand it, but if i think about the spatial pooler i've always felt it is going from a very high dimensional space like uh uh well no 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 i'll take that back uh i'm all right ignore everything i just said keep going <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know with our encoders and stuff we would expand the dimension yeah 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 I, right exactly i what i what i what I used to think of the spatial pooler as doing is taking something with a large number of potential points, um, a very large space, not dimensionality, but a large space in terms of uh, the number of things you might represent into a, um, a higher dimensional space, but with a fewer, you're putting them into buckets. So then you end up with fewer actual points to deal with. Um, and that's what's happening here too. Yeah. Maybe, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. I agree. If you go back to the previous slide. Is, is this like exactly the spatial pooler, or is this? Am I missing something? I was wondering the same That's thing. That's what I was looking at. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't have. It sounds like they're not talking about learning at all. Yeah, they got a random SP. Is that exactly the same? Something sounds like it. This sort of, uh, yeah, this sort of check off all the almost all the boxes <laughs> apart from the learning piece. And I want you to hold your thought on uh, the learning because uh, I'll come to that as well. Uh, so, uh, this is how the fruit flies nose works. Uh, I did not know this a month ago. Now I know this. I'm really happy. Uh, <laughs> uh, so again, uh, they do mean centering, uh, they do objection, uh, they increase the dimensionality, uh, then, uh, the projection, because the projection is sparse binary random. So what's, what's PN? Uh, they do that, and then they oh, have I'm something sorry, called an APL neuron. Uh, Anshuman, what is yeah. PN? What's the, the, the letters PN? Uh, projection neuron. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's right here uh, uh, on, on the diagram on the right. ORN, PN, and KC uh, at the bottom. So I got the oh. diagram from the paper. I did not build this, to be very clear. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, there are uh, 
uh, you know, the APL neuron basically uh, uh, provides innovatory feedback, which is a really cool idea uh, that I did not know about again, uh, that switches off uh, all but the top 5% of the highest firing uh, Kenyon cells, KCs. So uh, what happens in the end after all of this is uh, uh, an order tag is created, which is basically a sparse representation of uh, the order. This is it, this does look a lot like the spatial pool, no? I think over. Yeah, I mean, we had 2048 and so 2000. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we also did a lot of work in the in the percentage. We did we, we did a lot of variation. We did 5%, we did 2%, we did 1%, but um, but uh, but anyway, this looks very, very similar. Yeah, it looks identical to me. Paul, Paul Rhodes, if you know him, he's a neuroscientist. He had started this company to do olfaction. And, uh, and when you started talking about, hey, all these great neural algorithms to do this stuff, mm -hmm. I kind of remember thinking like, that's pretty damn simple. It's like the spatial puller. And, and he kind of ended up concluding it was pretty simple too. And then he ended up spending most of his time trying to come up with the sensors as opposed to the algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, I've seen this before. Okay. So moving on uh, to fly hash versus vanilla, LS, uh, vanilla LSH. Uh, so what these guys did was they, uh, recreated uh, the fl the fly's uh, nose circuitry, uh, and they created this fly hash algorithm. They picked three data sets, uh, the standard issue GLOVE, MNIST, and SIFT, and uh, they sampled uh, 10,000 vectors from each data set. Uh, for each run, they did 50 runs. They picked 1,000 vectors and computed the exact nearest neighbors, the top 2%. Then they computed approximate neural networks using standard issue LSH random projections and fly hash. And uh, they varied the hash length, they measured uh, uh, the overlap between the actual and predicted uh, uh, nearest neighbors. And they did this over 50 runs or 50 trials. Uh, they computed the mean uh, precision. And uh, they found that the lower the hash length, the better fly hash performed over uh, standard issue LSH, uh, and you can see this uh, uh, on. The... Could you just define uh, low uh, hash length again for me, please? So, hash length is basically uh, how do I put dimensions. So yeah, so the dimensions, right? Uh, it's basically, uh, the length of uh, the projections. Uh, I mean, the length of the random vectors that you're using, right? How many of them are you using at a time? So uh, if you're, if you're using, uh, so for instance- I got it, I think I got it, okay. Uh, so, uh, and then go back to the, the lower the hash length, the better fly hash perform. Yeah. That's, that's not intuitively obvious to me then. Uh, is, that, is that obvious to you? Um, I think it is. Only because I feel with uh, fly hash, uh, uh, because they're able to better separate out uh, the what you call it, uh, uh, the smells, right? Uh, the tags. Uh, it's uh, seems to me like the, a higher hash length would be more separation. Andrew, you're not know, talking about the absolute performance; it's the relative with LA, with the uh, locality sense of hashing, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I am. And, and oh, oh, okay. Thank you. That, that helps a lot. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll just move on to the next slide. Wait, Antoine, before you move on, those yeah. hash lengths seem pretty small, especially compared to the dimensionality of the data set. Wasn't the whole point of like fly LSH to expand the dimensionality of the hash and create something like an SDR? Um, yes. Uh, but the idea here is basically uh, the random projection, right? Uh, if you see, oh, you can't see my mouse, but step two. Yeah, we can see it. We can see oh, mouse. You can, oh, you can see my mouse? Okay. Step two right here, right? Uh, these are the vectors that are being talked about. Not this. These, right? So these vectors 
when you're doing the multiplies, right? Uh, you're essentially building out, uh, what you want to call it, uh, two, four, eight, 16, 32, whatever it is, right? Uh, so are you talking about the number of non-zero components in each of these uh, cases? So each KC points connects to some subset of the PNs, right? So are you talking about the number of non-zero connections that each KC makes to the PNs? Okay, now I'm confused. <laughs> you, were, you were saying it's about the arrows, not the cells. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So each, each, if you look at a KC there, yeah. it's a random binary projection, right? Right. Uh, so it's not, so the number of non-zero connections to the number, uh, to the PNs is gonna be I'm not 100 percent it's going to connect to some subset of it. some of it yes exactly yes thank you yes. is that the number you're varying yes yes okay so yes. it's kind of the sparsity of the weight vector in some sense okay Wait, so in that case what is the actual hash dimension on that next slide like yeah what is the actual number of uh, kenyan cells so i believe they use the same uh, for both so that would be 2000. 2000, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so just translating into our language, the dimension, the SDR dimensionality is fixed at 2000, but each one is looking at some subset of the inputs coming in and you're varying how many of those, how many it, uh, it connects to. Yeah. Or this is the weight sparsity. The weight sparsity, the weight sparsity. The weight sparsity. yeah. In our it's case, a, this is showing that. Uh, the sparser it is, the better it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, in, our, in our case, so the weight sparsity was it was learned, right? So um, mm -hmm. it wasn't fixed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, what these guys did next was they basically ran experiments uh, to isolate uh, each particular aspect of uh, fly hash. Uh, what they found was uh, sparse binary projections performed as well as uh, the dense uh, random projections across all hash lengths. And you can see the overlap across uh, the first two uh, plots here and here. Uh, they found that winner take all uh, induced hashing, uh, sparse uh, sparsity basically, along with dimensionality expansion that performed better than vanilla LSH, but uh, just the expansion and uh, uh, you know no WTA uh, there's not that big of a difference or not at all. I don't get the intuition behind this to be very honest. Wait also just to be clear this winner takes all that's it's not a strict winner takes all right this is top K. This is top. Yeah, okay. this is top. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure I have the right intuition, but it, it feels like the, the winner take all function, the way, we have that in the spatial cooler. And, um, and, and it's there. Originally, it got put in there because we wanted to have the number of active bits, the output of the spatial cooler, to be about the same every time. And so it was a way of it's sort of forcing yourself into a regular sparse distributed representation. Uh, and because if you allow the density or the density of your outputs to vary, um, then you lose a lot of the properties of SDRs. So we were trying to get it into a regular form, like, okay, the input uh, can be all over the place, but the output's gonna be 2000 bits of which so many are active and so many are not active, that, that kind of thing. So I don't know if that helps on the intuition here or not, but it was an essential part of the, of the spatial pool to have a winner take all. Okay. I guess it didn't help. I think, I think, I think I'll have to think about it a little bit more. So, um, yeah. So um, there were a bunch of follow-up uh, research papers that these guys published. Uh, the first thing they came out with was uh, novelty detection. So they claimed that uh, the fruit fly, which has, uh, which has been very active on the machine learning side, apparently, it's evolved a variation of a bloom filter to assess odor novelty. And uh, uh, 
the flies filter adjusts novelty responses based on two particular things. So similarity to previously experienced odors, so distance sensitive bloom filters, and uh, time elapsed since the odor was last encountered. So time sensitive bloom filters. So, Again, yeah, that's funny. So people yeah. have made the comment to us before that the spatial pool is like a bloom filter, I think. Hmm. And in the spatial pool that we did implement has both of these metrics in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, this uh, this particular piece, the distance sensitive bloom filter, uh, it's being used heavily by by the rice uh, CS people to speed up uh, neural network training. So uh, I can see where uh, uh, you know that would. I mean, if, if I understand this correctly, yeah, the similarity to previous experience odors is really just the the, the learning aspect of the spatial puller. It's it's uh, it's trying to figure out what are the overlaps of these inputs and mm -hmm. that you've seen recently. And the time elapsed one says. Hey, the world is evolving all the time. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. you know, you should be, if you don't see something often, yeah. or even if it was often, but yeah. if it's not if it's not occurring a lot in the, in the, now, you should start forgetting it or you know, yeah. or stop, don't give it such a high representation anymore. Right. So that we have those learning rules. Like unless Suitai kicked me or someone else kicked me if I got that wrong. Seems right. Um, someone I see someone has posted something on the chat. I don't know who it is or if you have a question, but we're not really looking at the chat window, so if you have a comment to make, just butt in. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. That was that was a while ago, so no oh, longer relevant. Yeah. All good. Yeah. Okay. So um, so this was one paper that they came out with. Then uh, another paper that they came out with was uh, continual learning. So this is uh, earlier this year. They said uh, insights on continual learning from fruit flies. Uh, so the fruit fly has definitely done much more. Our, our understanding of the fruit fly has evolved much more. So they claim now the, uh, the nasal circuit has a two-layered architecture, the encoder and an associative learning mechanism. And they proposed a fly model algorithm that reduces catastrophic forgetting by stitching together multiple concepts, sparse coding, Synaptic freezing, perceptron style learning, and no backdrop. Which, uh, again, I glanced through both of these papers, which is why there's only one uh, slide on each. But I think uh, these might be worth uh, putting on everybody's radar. Is this, uh, I mean, I wonder if this is related to our um, permanence idea. You know, I see the word synaptic freezing. Well, um, I mean, the permanence is a way of saying, you know, that this has occurred so often, I, I really want to take a long time before I forget it, or something that that hasn't occurred as often, and it, I can forget it more rapidly. I, I don't know if that's related to that. I have to look at the paper. I don't know here. Yeah. One result that this reminds me of, which was based on experiments in mice, not fruit flies, was um, the olfactory drift paper. And what they observed was that the more frequently an animal was exposed to a smell, the slower the drift. I don't quite see the mapping between this and that, but it seems like worth fleshing out. Yeah, we don't, you know, our models really have no concept of drift. And so that's why it's really kind of disturbing. Um, so I, I, that, that's a good observation, but it's, it's like, well, it's, it's deeper than that. <laughs> drift is bad for us. Mm -hmm. As it would be for most models of the brain, I guess, you know, so. Well, there's an ongoing question. I, I mean, you, you know this, but there is there is a question as to whether or not it's really drift or if it's uh, indicative of some type of learning. And um, if there's something similar to a bloom filter going on here where um, the more frequently you're exposed to something, the less likely you are to forget it. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, although I actually wasn't aware connection. of that. Uh, I wasn't aware that the, that argument, I mean, to me, the way that was original, I haven't been following the drift thought, but um, I thought the original idea that drift was, a, you know, it, even un, almost, I thought they were saying under any circumstance, whatever your representation is, is, is just going to completely morph over time. Um, so even if you're, even if you're, you're, the statistical the nature of your input hasn't changed, it drifts, which I, I can't explain, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, that is what they found in, in that experiment. Um, but it, it sounds like there's 
a whole bunch of work blowing up right now exploring this idea and the findings aren't all totally consistent I, yeah. I would struggle to summarize them all but um that's well, maybe, I, maybe we can up. maybe we can hope that that the that the way they interpreted the data initially wasn't correct and that actually you know i feel a little bit like you know einstein trying to protect you know the the nature of space and time for his whole life but against quantum mechanics you know it's like well let's hope these guys are wrong <laughs> <laughs>